your success really excites me. And that's the ultimate goal to make you guys successful. All right, let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology in action. No new mystery charts this week. There really hasn't been any setups in quite a while. So here's the CLOV, and it's been a little bit of a disappointment. It hasn't anything wrong just yet, but it hadn't done anything right either. Anyway, those were the parameters. Entry of three, stop at two, IPT of four. Very volatile stock. I forget the HV on it, but it's up close to 100 on a 50-day historical volatility. So that's what it requires. Anyway, uh, big blue arrow pointing higher. Also, lots and lots of Landry light. Look back here, you can see lots of Landry light. And then in more recent times, Landry light, meaning the lows are greater than moving average. My favorite moving average for this is a 30 EMA, for what it's worth, but the 20 EMA. I know you want to party with me, but it used to be my favorite. And now I'm, I've, uh, I have an affinity for the 30 EMA. It's probably not a huge difference between the two. Anyway, you can see it pulls back and notice that uh, it did touch the moving average and then land your light when that happens, it goes to zero and then you had one or two days and then back to zero again. Anyway, it's uh, back above the moving average, but one thing that's interesting is that obviously it triggered and so far it just hasn't done anything, but it did have a little bit of a rally and that tiny little bit of rally, the, posi the open position based on 100K account was worth $400. Unfortunately, at the low today, it swung all the way back down to the downside. Now, the point I'm trying to make is you just have to get used to these swings. And longer term, that's where the money is. And then obviously, if you're in a longer term trend following position, the swings get bigger and bigger. And that's why we take partial profits. And I'll touch upon all that in just one second. Anyway, it can be a little boring just sitting there watching a stock go mostly sideways. I don't believe in dead money. Dead money has little or no chances of any further appreciation well you never know that because you never know what's going what the market's going to do so we'll sit in positions for a long time in fact i'll show you one that we sat in for a couple of years and a lot of that time it was doing nothing but it turned out to be one of our biggest winners in a long time all right let's take a look at the tfm 10 percent system real quick and then i want to show you a crypto trade these zones in here, inspired by Jeff, who's here tonight, the 10% zone down here means you're 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high. At the top of this zone here, the green zone, you would be exactly the 50-week closing high. So you can see, based on this, this is a weekly chart for what it's worth. It's a weekly system. So based on today's close, we actually close at an all-time high. The weekly chart actually looks a little bit better than the daily. Anyway, there's the rules. It just has to, it has to close 10% or more away from that 50-week closing high and also close below the 50-week simple moving average. The moving average I added in as a whipsaw filter. Now, I added it in several years ago, maybe five or six years ago. But anyway, the system has been unchanged since, even though there's been couple of times where I've thought, well, now that I've seen this thing in real time for the last five or six years, we might change some things. So it's like, nope, let's just leave where it is and see what happens. Anyway, uh, the buy would be, buy is a little bit more stringent. You need two bars of land your light, meaning two lows greater than moving average. And you have to be within 10% of the 50 week closing high. So bar one, bar two. So you would buy on close. This original research was done on a calendar basis. So I filed this on a calendar basis, meaning that on Friday, if you if all this works out and you close within the 10% closing high and you have two bars of Landry Light, that would be a buy on Friday. Same thing goes for a sell. Have to close the week below the 50-week moving average and 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high. I told myself tonight I wasn't going to go through all the rules, but I, I find myself doing it anyway. Anyway, to stop out, you would have to drop all the way down to this level here. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is the 50 week moving average is catching up to the 10% line. So if that 50 week moving average gets above the 10% line, then the 10% line just sell. Right now it's below it. So now your 50 week moving average, a close below that, not a dip below. You'll notice every now and then you might get a dip below it, but a close below it would be a sell signal. Now NASDAQ did not stop out. It came close to a 10% or the Qs I should say, 10% loss here. But even that was well above that 50-week. Anyway, as I've said a thousand times, for S and Gs. When was that? Back in 2023, March or April, into March, I think. I bought 100 shares. If you go in, you can't sleep at night. Watch some old weekend charts where I show the actual trade that I took. Just 100 shares. 
And I figured, eh, 100 shares, who cares, right? But actually turned into real money, which is kind of cool, but uh, a good problem to have, but a problem nonetheless. But you can see 50 week moving averages still below that 10% zone. So that would be the sell signal there. And notice here at the top of the green zone, that would be the 50 week closing high. So we just made that there. If you go back to the S&P chart, you can see that that green went up a little bit, that zone went up a little bit because we're at all time highs in the S&P 500. Anyway, at the peak, I'm sorry, uh, based on a, a mark to market of where I grabbed this chart a little earlier, it was up 16,000, almost $17,000. And then at the peak up here it was up even more. In fact, I'll show you the drawdowns here just real quick. So with a longer term trend following system, especially without money management, you will have some really abysmal drawdowns. Your accuracy is gonna be super low too. And again, not to beat the dead horse, but that's why I've developed the hybrid money management system where I'm taking partial profits. And I'll touch upon that in just one second. But anyway, that $8,000 spill was uh, was a little, I'm not gonna say nerve wracking, but it, it, it all of a sudden this small position became real money, watching $8,000 evaporate. Anyway, this was a crypto trade that I talked about in last week's Dave Landry's The Week of Charts. And now keep in mind with these, these altcoins, or as I like to call them, shit coins. And I know that's a little vulgar. It's S-H-Y-T is what they call them. It's a little vulgar, but it kind of reminds me that these things are, are, are made to trade. It's kind of like trading sardines. It, the old story, I'm sure you all heard it a hundred times, but the sardine price was getting really, really, really high. And one guy paid the top dollar for a pair, uh, a can of sardines and he goes to open them up and they're rotten. And then he goes back to the guy who sold them to him and he's like, you stupid fool, those are for trading, not eating. And that kind of exemplifies the, the shit coins or, or really any stock for that matter. My daughter was asking me, did I ever invest in a company or trade a company I didn't believe in? And it's like, well, I, I don't care what the company does. And and uh, this, I explained to her, I said, uh, I bought a coal stock. I, I knew it was energy. I didn't know it was coal a few years back. Not that it would have mattered. Now, I do have, I did have one client that I know of that told me he didn't buy it because he doesn't believe in coal stocks or doesn't believe in coal. Or it's like, well, you know, if you're going to trade, you're going to trade. And, and my clients are paying me to find stocks. And I can't say, oh, I don't like what this company does. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to buy that stock. You know, or maybe maybe you like a company and it's it's a short. It's like, ah, I don't want to short it because I like the company. Well, don't confuse the issue with facts is one thing that I often say when it comes to that. So you really have to have to not care. And like I told a guy who didn't buy the coal stock, it's like, well, look, you know, buy a coal stock and then make a bunch of money off of it and then go plant a bunch of trees or or whatever you want to do with that money. Anyway, I, I understand some people bring their ethics into the uh, trading. Oh, goodness. Oh, it's you, Jeff. Okay, okay. So I did a seminar a couple of weeks back. I know I'm going to last week in band camp, your death, at the TSAASF conference, annual conference. And I've spoken there three times over the last 15 years. Great bunch of people. By the way, you don't have to be in San Francisco to join and uh, you can do a lot of the stuff online and they have great speakers. Bollinger was there, Damon Pavlatis was there, Linda Rasky, they, they always have the who's who and sometimes me <laughs> speaking. Uh, but anyway, it, I was wondering because uh, we're gonna get to that trade at the end of this presentation and just to kind of show a point. And one thing that I pointed out in, in the seminar, I wish I'd, I'd known it was you, Jeff, because one thing I wanted to point out is that I didn't adjust for um, the dividends and I've never rarely have I owned a stock because I'm trading momentum that has dividends. OK, so I didn't think about adjusting the stop lower and Jeff did that. and He's still long. So that's that's awesome. That's exciting. So let me know when you stop out. We'll 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 do a chart on that and um, and maybe we'll get you in, into the webinar to talk about it. Anyway, never say never, but I try not to show you a trade here like, ah, I just showed you the best one. I try to only show trades that I recommend ahead of time. But in this case, I don't tend to recommend altcoins. Although if you guys that are in my Facebook group want me to, I'll be very happy to. In fact, we've been it's been a little quiet in there lately. So 
I'll be happy to to throw in a few altcoin trades trades. Now remember, this is kind of S and G type trading. This isn't my bread and butter, but when these things go, they can really go. And what my goal here is to just see what I could do for fun and and parlay small accounts. But they do have their uses as far as there was a gentleman that was struggling with trading in the aforementioned seminar last week at Bandcamp. And one thing I didn't think about telling him at the time, but he could he could go in and trade these these altcoins with with a very little tiny bit of money to get the reps in. When when you're trading and you want to become better at trading, just like if you want to become better at anything in your life, you, you've got to get the reps in. And one thing I was thinking about earlier is that reps are important, but you got to you have to get in quality reps. Okay, it's sort of like the the 10,000 hour rule, the Malcolm Gladwell type of rule. You need 10,000 hours, but you need deliberate practice. You need to work harder to getting better. So if you make 10,000 trades or spend 10,000 hours trading, if you're not constantly working to get better, then then that's, that doesn't really do you any good. So anyway, I think all coins are one way to get the reps in. You get the ups and downs. And there's a bear market every six weeks here, sometimes every six days. And there's a and there's a bull market somewhere in between every six days or every six uh, weeks. So it's a lot of fun. Anyway, the entry was there. I took profits here. Now, keep in mind that I'm not a breakout trader, but if you're trading a highly inefficient market or a market like 1999 in stocks, for those of you who are old enough to remember that, it's funny. <laughs> Talk about 1999, and people are like, what? What was that? You know? <laughs> Anyway, uh, but back then everything was crazy and just going straight up. You just buy stuff going straight up. And sometimes in trading you can, such as sometimes the IPOs, you can do that. And in certain markets, occasionally like these altcoins when they really begin to take off. So I do sort of trade breakouts in altcoins. I prefer to trade like a pullback or something like that in general, but I will trade breakouts in altcoins. I will trade breakouts in IPOs too, because they're wildly inefficient or certainly can be. Anyway, in the altcoins, just to keep the math easy, I just use 20%, okay? So if I'm getting in at 48 cents, I'm flipping out at 58 cents in this particular case. Now, one thing I did as I was putting together this presentation or putting together this slide is like, you know what? I've done this mining thing, so to speak. And as I've said quite a few times, I've looked into miners, of course I did, because I'm a nerd. <laughs> and then I figured out that it's a, it's a a it would be a horrible waste of money. If anybody knows knows how to mine Bitcoin at home and actually make money at it, let me know. It just doesn't seem like something that would lend itself well to a to a private individual, especially with the cost of power. Now, if you got cheap power somewhere, then by all means, buy yourself a little miner and plug it in. But then there's all other problems. So I figured like, well, why not stay in my wheelhouse? And if I can make money on these altcoins, maybe turn into a little Bitcoin here and there just for S and Gs. And so I mined off, so to speak, $25. Now, you know, these things are going to likely spike and come back in. But if I could take a little crumb here and there just for S and Gs again and put it in a Bitcoin and see where, see where it goes. Now, I'm not an investor, but so if it ever became something substantial, then, of course, it would be hard for me to hold on uh, like Michael Saylor through all the ups and downs. <laughs> but for now, I think it's just kind of fun way to, to get a little free Bitcoin, so to speak. And then later in the presentation, we'll talk about free positions and the importance of that. But anyway, so there's the mining transaction I did earlier today when I was putting the slide together. And I just sold a tiny bit of, bit of this. And this thing might implode tomorrow. But if it does, I got an extra $25 out of it. And I threw it over in Bitcoin just for S&Gs. I know you're probably like, wow, this guy. <laughs> I'm so impressed. So if you zoom in, I didn't have a, a, a particular pattern in mind, but I do remember looking at this the day after it would have triggered on the 220 EMA system, which I now call a 230 EMA system. And you're just looking for two bars of Landry light, lows greater than the moving average, and then you're looking to buy above the highest high of those two highs. That's the entire system. If you Google two slash... 20 EMA breakout system. It was in stocks and commodities in 1996, I think. I'm dating myself a little bit. Anyway, you had two bars of Landry Light. So the, the, the 230 EMA breakout would have been on that day there. 
I don't recommend you rush out and trade this 230 EMA type of system mechanically. But every now and then I'll look at charts and I'm amazed that you'll get a signal, it doesn't trigger, get a signal, doesn't trigger, get a signal, doesn't trigger. You'll get four or five of these whipsaws and I'd be willing to bet that if you took a signal after three or four of those whipsaws and these whipsaws don't trigger, which is kind of crazy, that this stupid little, which is I, which I actually use as a whipsaw filter, by the way, in the TFM temperature system, but this stupid little system will avoid a lot of whipsaw, which I find quite amazing. Anyway, I'm a nerd with all this stuff, but that was a, that's when I, I saw this uh, shit coin was rallying and then I ended up buying at 48 cents, like I said, 48 cents and change. And then again, I put that IPT at 58, but uh, it was going up and it had bottomed out for a long time. And I thought it was uh, kind of cool looking just because it hadn't made this big old fat bottom. It didn't have a whole lot of overhead resistance for a while. So I figured it was worth a shot. But anyway, that's my thinking on that one. And, and again, you guys in Facebook, I'll start posting these trades ahead of time for the altcoins. Now it's heating up again. All right, let's talk about the Landry 100 just real quick. Like I said last week, basically the reason I'm doing this is just kind of proof of concept that you that you in some cases with a lot of caveats, you can just buy markets going at the new highs. Now, if a market's going from A to C and B is somewhere in between, it's going to have to pass through B on its way to C, and that's the whole buy at B or the basis of the buy at B in the IPO in the IPOs. Now, I don't recommend you just buy new highs, but if you're buying a big basket of stocks, like 100 stocks, and I don't actually buy these stocks personally, although I was thinking a little while ago, I was getting ready for the for this uh, webinar, but at some point in time, maybe my next life, I might just run a, a portfolio of this maybe in, in retirement, which I don't see myself doing, but <laughs> you know, maybe I run a big portfolio of this and that's, that's the main thing that I do. I don't know. We'll see. Um, I did run this list, so to speak, years ago. And I forget why I stopped. I think the software I was using to track it, they no longer made it. And uh, now I'm tracking the spreadsheet, which now I remember it's kind of a pain in the ass, but it's not, it's not nearly, it's not impossible. It's just an extra little work every day. But anyway, when I ran it years ago, a couple things I noted. One, it prints money in momentum markets. Uh, two, it gets absolutely crushed every now and then. And what's kind of amazing is this list will get crushed usually two or three days before a major market sell-off. Sometimes the S&P will make brand new highs and this list will get crushed. The The only thing is I don't have that daily equity on it like I used to. So if somebody knows an easy way to, to put all this into software and do it with a daily equity or some software out there, let me know. But uh, for now, I'm just it's kind of proof of concept. I just want to maintain this. And it also does a couple other things too. It makes sure I'm seeing the, the NVIDIAs of the world and the hot stocks and they might not set up for my core methodology, but at least they're on my radar by managing this momentum list. So that's that's um, pretty much it on that. Any questions or anything? Wow, Jeff said, take the dividends off the stop. Yeah, that's right. That's correct because the stock is gonna adjust down for whatever they pay on the dividend. And uh, he said it pays 280 a year in dividends. And that's a lot of money, especially for a momentum stock. We'll have to take a look at that one. Uh, let me just put it up on my chart so I don't forget and see where it is. Wow, that's that's a wild that's a wild and crazy ride there. Okay, so Landry 100, you can see nice move. Oh, also as I pointed out last week, this one's still the number one in the list. But notice that the day I put it in, the next three or four days, it just absolutely imploded. So if you were just trying to buy the new highs, I think it'd be a very difficult way to trade. But if you're buying a hundred different stocks or at least hanging on to 100 different uh, different ones and doing that constant window dressing like I talked about when I described this earlier, then uh, it can work, okay? Especially in the momentum market. Now, keep in mind that if we start going into a bit of a downturn, first time I ran this, I was gonna always try to keep 100 stocks in it, but we went into a bit of a downturn and I just couldn't find enough stocks to keep 100 stocks in the list. And so I ended up with much, much less than 100 and cash is treated as an asset class or a slot and maybe this time i might throw some et i did throw a few etfs in i think early on to get up to 100 and get, to get some exposure in certain areas like semiconductors or whatever but i think maybe 
next time, uh, not inverse ETFs because those are kind of tricky for longer term holding, as I've discussed before. The um, you get a bit of a decay, so to speak, in those. So you got to watch that. But anyway, maybe next time I'll throw some bond ETFs or whatever into it, and we'll see what happens. Next bear market. This one's pulled back a li little bit since last week, but it did have about a 70% run uh, as of uh, tonight's close. So John says his cost is now 749 on that ARLP. That's so cool that you were able to that you were able to hold on to it that long. Anyway, so here's the I just grabbed the top of the list. Uh, these well, these are the ones that stopped out, and you'll notice they had some pretty substantial gains. This NNE, we'll talk about that one in just one second. That was one that was in the trading service. It was also an IPO before that. Now, to my surprise, and I guess I should have been that surprised, if you add them all up. You miss some negative ones down here that are not shown. But if you add them all up, you'll see that this is actually slightly in the negative by about eight tenths of 1%. And this was started, I think, late May, early June. So, yeah, late May, uh, May 29th. But the reason this is negative is because I'm pulling out more losers than winners. And the other thing I want to run by you guys is, again, there's no money management. This is just kind of a proof of concept type of thing. Sort of like the TFM 10% system sorted out. But anyway, I'm wondering if I'm up 100% on a position, should I pull half of that off? And that's something I'm kind of noodling with. And that might be um, an interesting thing to do. Anyway, you guys in Facebook, I'll, if you want the list, I'll be happy to publish it there. 